and click save. Where is it? Where is it? Where save. Is it? Save. There you go. Hi, and welcome to another webcast. Don't stack uh, your lips. Okay. Sorry. Welcome to another webcast <laughs> of A Mirror Darkly. He's stacking his lips. I'm sorry, guys. And today is Dangerous Questions, Truth, and Academic Freedom. I should be dangerous with that question. Well, oh, dangerous question. question. No, no. <laughs> dangerous questions might be, um, does this make my butt look big? Do these pants make me look fat? That's yeah. Not how you I'm, so, I, Whatever. I'm so sorry. That was just so bad. What? What do you say? How he said it? Well, anyway. Sorry. Um, His daughter's here, so I'm being weird. Yes. Okay, go on. Okay. So the question today is primarily on academic freedom, and that sounds academic, but it's actually very practical. Um, it's a big issue, particularly in Christian institutions of higher learning, but we find it in all aspects of our lives. And it's not something that afflicts only Christian institutions, it's a human problem. Uh, Christian institutions will have doctrinal statements and you have to agree with them, and so you're not allowed to go outside those guardrails. Uh, you are free, but only within the limits of the constraint that they put you on. Uh, color outside the lines and you will be in trouble. Um, and this is a problem. Um, the question that I want to ask is, what is it that is important. Are the guardrails what is important? Uh, is it, or is it the truth that is important? Shouldn't conformity with reality be our primary goal rather than conformity with whatever artificial guidelines we have created to try to keep everybody from running amok? Is the pursuit of truth, I think, is what matters regardless of where it might take us. Right, but... we shouldn't be afraid of the truth. Right, but there are Christians who are afraid of questions because they're afraid of challenging their beliefs. And they're, in, they're insecure in their... Let me, let me not say that they are afraid of being challenged in their beliefs. They're insecure in their knowledge base to mm -hmm. defend what they believe. I learned that through um, when the um, Jehovah's Witness came, right. and and I did a lot of research, and I really had to defend my faith, and so I had to really know what I believed, and some of it I just took for granted, and that's normal, especially mm -hmm. if you've been a Christian your whole entire life, and so um, having to share what I believe with her and to refute her claims mm -hmm. about Christ and mm -hmm. about no heavenly hope and things like that and mm -hmm. and everything I had to really dig down and find why I believe what I believe mm -hmm. so um, that was a huge challenge but it was good for me because first of all it gave me confidence in what I believe just like I'm leaning over for my coffee I left it over here did you go it, to my office and get the sheet of papers that are next to the Yes, I can. On the right side, please. Thank you. So anyway, am I um, gonna do it? No, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Yes. So, but okay, anyway. Okay, fine then. Well, it was to give you a million dollars those papers, but I guess you don't want it, and it just expired. <laughs> So we had technical big. difficulties before we got started, oh. and so I got very okay. distracted by getting those things fixed. Um, so there are a couple of things that I was hoping to have with me here, and I entirely forgot those and the, all the issues I had technically. And I think the other thing, I think the other thing that intimidates people when you ask questions like that is that they, you need this? I know what I know. Yes. I know that it's true it's and papers, it's, it's set in stone, mm -hmm. like as if there's nothing mm -hmm. more we can discover about right. God's word or, oh, and here's it's another thing I've come across. I know. So it wasn't just like, two yeah. papers. Okay, I'm trying to talk here. You too? Okay. So distracting. Sorry. I'm like, you're welcome. I have important things to say. You're welcome. And you're just like okay. super rude. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, the, the, other, the other thing is, is um, people that, um, that don't like to speculate about mm -hmm. things in the Bible. I ran right. into this in Sunday school. 
And I would say, this is speculation, but could it be possible that like, well, it doesn't say that. And it's like, well, just because it doesn't say it doesn't mean it's not possible. It could be a thing. Yes. You know, so, and it wasn't like far out speculation. It was just like, well, perhaps this is what the groups around them were doing. And that's why they were doing this or we were doing some Old Testament stuff. But I don't remember the exact scenario. But it was interesting because there were people in the class mm -hmm. that were super hesitant to speculate. But if you don't speculate, you don't discover new things. Right. So it's kind of like that dream big thing. Like, you know, can we can we be on Mars in four years? Well, we don't know, but let's try. Yes. If we don't, we'll make, we make it in five or six years, which yes. is faster than we're doing it now. Right. So. Yeah. Elon Musk says by 2024, or actually 2022. Mm -hmm. So. So Larice joined us, and yes. she said that when Jehovah's Witnesses come to her door, um, she takes her material and then she hands them a tract. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. I talked to them now, although there was a man that came to the door this morning. There were two issues with that. One, he came with a student from my school. And, oh. yeah, so I don't want kids from my school knowing where I live. Although this little guy, I don't think he could express that to anyone. But, um, and two, Robin was still asleep. And I, like, didn't want to be, um, like, talking a lot in the living room with him still asleep. So, um, but I told the man I would pray for him. So, um, and he went away. So, but probably because, well, I would talk, I have no problem talking to a man about what I believe, but. It's just not appropriate with. No, it's totally it's fine. fine. But I would probably, see, because the, the women that I was talking to, we, it, we were women. So I kind of kept him out of it, except I had one question I had to ask him one time. But I think he's been that there a few times. with a with uh, a more man, more likely, he's more likely to respect what you believe. Particularly in that kind of a group. Yeah. More yeah. Patriarchal. Right. So that is why I would want you to be there mm -hmm. and to talk to him because in from his perspective, you carry more validity than I would. Mm -hmm. So which is an unfortunate oh, reality God. in a lot of our culture. Right. Um, But people will be uncomfortable pursuing certain lines of research because they are fearful for where the research might go because it might um, kill some sacred cows. Mm -hmm. And in Christianity, in Christian institutions, they will make noise about, yes, we accept academic freedom, but then you've got all these guidelines that you can't move outside of. Um, and some schools will have more detailed um, guidelines than others will. And from my perspective, I think that's inappropriate uh, because really what should be most critical to us, any human being, is what corresponds with reality, that is, what is the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, Pontius Pilate, before he um, sent Jesus to be crucified, Jesus has told him that uh, those who like the truth listen to me. And Pilate's response was, well, what is the truth? Uh, elsewhere in John's Gospel, back in chapter 8, I think it was, he said that uh, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And truth is, I would argue, an incredibly important thing because it's very hard to be free if you don't know the truth. Mm -hmm. You are then constrained by your misperceptions and the lies and misunderstandings that otherwise you could be freed from. Um, and it's not just in Christianity that you have sacred cows that you're not allowed to pursue issues that you can't pursue. Stephen Pinker, back in 2007, Stephen Pinker is the author of The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, which is a, the subtitle I think was along the lines of why his um, violence declined over the last couple hundred years. Because despite what you see in the news, we are currently living in the most peaceful, most prosperous period ever in world history. You wouldn't know that from the news, but if you actually look at the raw data, then you would know that. Uh, Pinker last year wrote a book, last year, year before, no, 2017, uh, he wrote a book called Enlightenment Now, and it's a smaller version of 
the other book, I would argue. That is, he goes over a lot of the same sorts of things, although he emphasizes the importance of the Enlightenment, again, the pursuit of truth and all of those sorts of things, scientific revolution, uh, the value of that. Uh, it was considered such an important book that Bill Gates actually gave copies of the book for free to all college graduates of that year. Hmm. So anyway, back in 2007, Steven Pinker wrote a, another book, wrote a book called, um, where is it? Well, it's probably not really important for, um, The Stuff of Thought. And he also wrote a preface or an introduction to a book um, called uh, What is Your Dangerous Idea? Today's Leading Thinkers on the Unthinkable, which was published by HarperCollins. And he lists several difficult questions that people are uncomfortable with. And he's not arguing that these are questions. See, part of it is that people are afraid to ask the questions because what if the answer turns out to be yes? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times these questions, the answer will be no. But if it's yes, then that kills a lot of sacred cows that people don't want to have killed, and so let's not just, let's not ask the question at all. And so these are some of the questions he posited in his introduction. Do most victims of sexual abuse suffer no lifelong damage? Did Native Americans engage in genocide and despoil the landscape? Do men have an innate tendency to rape? Did the crime rate go down in the 1990s because two decades earlier, poor women aborted children who would have been prone to violence? Are suicide terrorists well-educated, mentally healthy, and morally driven? Would the incidence of rape go down if prostitution were legalized? Uh, is morality just a product of the evolution of our brains with no inherent reality? Would society be better off if heroin and cocaine were legalized? We were going that way, so we'll find <laughs> out, I guess. Is homosexuality the symptom of an infectious disease? Would it be consistent with our moral principle to give parents the option of euthanizing uh, newborns with birth defects that would consign them to a life of pain and disability? Have religions killed a greater proportion of people than uh, Nazism? Do parents have any effect on the character or intelligence of their children? Uh, would Africa have a better chance of rising out of poverty if it hosted more polluting industries or accepted Europe's nuclear waste? Um, is the average intelligence of Western nations declining because duller people are having more children than smarter people? Um, should people have the right to clone themselves or enhance the genetic traits of their children? And so on dangerous questions, questions people don't want to have asked, let alone try to answer them. Uh, the pursuit of truth, though, should be the thing that is most important to mm -hmm. us, regardless of where it happens to take us. Well, and some questions are politically charged, so well, you can't. Well, that's why you can't ask, and again, uh, some questions them. are religiously charged mm -hmm. in Christian institutions, some questions are politically charged. And in both cases, the politics or the religion takes precedence over truth. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that that's not a healthy place right. to be. That is, we should not be constrained in an academic setting, or really pretty much any setting, um, by the fear of the truth. That is, the truth should be something that we treasure, even if it makes us uncomfortable. In the movie The Matrix, which you didn't particularly like because it, of the one scene. Right, it was a bad time for me. It was a bad time for you. But Wait, it's, what happened? Don't worry about it. Um, but anyway, the question that Neo is uh, yeah. asked near the beginning of the film is, will he take the red pill or the blue pill? If he takes the blue pill, he goes back to his comfortable life living in an illusion. But it's a comfortable illusion. Or he could take the red pill and find out where the truth actually lies. Mm. And the truth is very painful, very uncomfortable, and a horrible thing. A lot of people don't like the truth as so a the consequence. So the pants really do make your belt look fat. Yes. <laughs> There's uh, a title for a book. Yes, the pants surely. Those, those pants really do make your butt look flat, and other truths you're afraid to find out. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's yes. your bestseller, hon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is very painful, and this is not a new concept. Um, let's see if I can bring it up here. Um, Stephen Crane wrote, um, besides writing The Red Badge of Courage, he also wrote um, 
poetry. And um, one of his, a couple of his poems deal with the issue of what is truth. Put your coffee over there on the shelf. And yes, I should. Two um, hands. Coffee is more important than truth for Robin. Coffee is truth. <laughs> Water is truth. It keeps you alive. No, I had a nice water conversation. Water exists so that you can make coffee. I had a nice conversation with the Dunkin' Donuts people today about coffee. Yeah. Yeah. The girl goes. She goes. Oh, that's a good idea to put espresso in the coffee. The girl worked at the window. She goes. She goes. But I don't like really strong coffee. She goes. You must like strong coffee. I said. Yeah. I said. For a while, this the Dunkin' Donuts coffee wasn't working for me because I'm a Starbucks coffee drinker, and it's not like I didn't drink Dunkin' Donuts coffee when I was a kid, so it has no like emotional tie for me like the donuts do. So um, anyway, so there was nobody else in the drive through line, so I just talked to them. But the one girl, um, <laughs> Larissa's says, coffee is most definitely truth. Yes. But um, the, the one girl, she's like, yep. She goes, she goes, I have the dark roast with an espresso shot. I'm like, oh, dark roast, that's a good idea. So I'm going to try that, I think, next week. Because every Saturday morning I get coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. Yes, coffee is most definitely truth, and so is a vanilla cream filled from Dunkin' Donuts, I'm just mm -hmm. saying. And if Dunkin' Donuts uh, sales spike over the next week, that's thanks to me. You're welcome. Yes. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. If I had not been distracted by uh, technical issues, I would have found already it. found this. Well, I can, I can entertain people Why with more entertain, Dunkin' lore if you'd like. Go ahead and entertain people. For a little bit while I locate <laughs> um, um, this thing. Well, it's interesting because teaching in a public school, I don't have true academic freedom. I have mm -hmm. to teach the curriculum that they give. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been a lot of controversy over California's particular curriculum. Mm -hmm. But what I find interesting, there's one controversial piece of information that's in the student book, and I have yet to find it in the teacher's book. Somebody told me it's not in the teacher's edition. Mm -hmm. So in my world, if it's not in the teacher's edition, I guess it it's not, exist. yeah, it doesn't exist. So, because um, in this area, it's pretty conservative. People aren't gonna want that piece of information being told to third graders. Right. So, I mean, if people want to tell high schoolers, that's different because high schoolers are a little bit more um, intellectually developed than third graders, but yeah. I have an issue with teaching. I don't have an issue with the topic, but basically this is what it is. It, there's a sentence in the student's book that says, Sally Ride was the first lesbian American to go to space. I'm like, well, why do you have to be a lesbian American? Why can't you just be a woman in space why does that have to be like a thing in third grade I mean that's fine it's I mean Tchaikovsky was gay True. but I, if I listen to a piece of music with third graders I don't tell them oh and by the way Tchaikovsky was gay because that's not something third graders need to worry about yet well it's like saying saying that Beethoven wasn't it's yeah like who cares right well like if I would like I'm a straight American teacher if I somebody writes about me in the future are they gonna write that about me that I'm a, <laughs> that I'm a heterosexual American I don't know I think that's important <laughs> but not for third graders matter. to yeah. know no they don't they shouldn't know even be, to sleep with and the thing is they shouldn't be even knowing what a lesbian is right are you it, she asked if you it, got if we're using common core yeah actually it's it's really good because it's way less standards and it goes a lot deeper and there's a lot more you can do it that the kids can do project-based learning but it has to be done correctly the um, kids shouldn't be knowing these things period like, like when they, don't, they don't need to know what a lesbian is they don't need to unless their parents are gay then right. they don't need to know but then they already know that's what putting, that that's, is. That's, that's, that, that's putting some a kid in something that can really be harmful so to well, some it's an extent to some extent right it is not appropriate for a kid to know right now Right. right, I don't need to know who people sleep with. Exactly. Anyway, when I'm thinking in terms of academic Kid. freedom and the topic for today, I'm thinking more in terms of with adults. Mm -hmm. That is, age appropriate right. is an entirely different right. issue. Yeah, but, um, but I was told that some years back, I was like, well, what if I want to teach something? And they said, well, you have limited academic freedom teaching for a public school. And I was right. like, oh, did not know that. 
So. Well, it's because it's age appropriate, I would guess. No, it's because oh. what the state wants us to teach versus not. So ah. I can't teach something just because I feel like it. Yeah. It needs to be within the state. See, one of the problems I had with certain but institutions. But there's a lot of flexibility. You know, one of the problems I had with certain institutions I taught at, and as an older person now, I would have approached things differently than at the time. Um, but they wanted to constrain how certain classes were taught. Mm -hmm. That is, they want to have multiple versions. Of, that is, they want to teach freshmen a particular class that up until then had normally been taught only to seniors. And they wanted to have five different classes of with a different teacher in each class. But they wanted all the classes to cover exactly the same material at exactly the same time with all the tests being exactly the same. Oh, it sounds like the California state standards when we were when, <laughs> when we weren't able to pass that obnoxious test. Yes. They wanted us all teaching exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. So one How time effective is that? And not because the district personnel we knew were walking through so we wrote a script. I had a sub that day and I told the sub you have to follow the script exactly and watch the clock. Mm -hmm. If you if you get a little bit ahead talk slower or pause for a minute. I said you have to be on this this exact because we did all of third grade we sat down we wrote a script so that when the district walked through we we're all teaching exactly so they would just go to the next room and barely miss a word <laughs> so so we gave we gave them a taste of their own medicine yeah. really as looking at the situation Sorry. at this point i would have told them to go suck it but anyway huh so i probably would have told them no yeah and that i was just going to teach the class how i wanted to teach it life. academic freedom it's guaranteed by my contract so, you know. oh. yeah I think Forget I it. got bit by that spider on my foot. Well, it's just going to itch for a while. It'll be fine. When you get a hook of Calamite on it. But the freedom to pursue. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm going to do that ever again. What? Do you remember me getting put on Calamine lotion? I was screaming because it was burning. Okay. I don't trust that. This is off topic. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, it's just because my, <laughs> my foot is hurting. I was trying to get more. Anyway. Anyway, go on. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um,. The um, problem with um, the situation that I had at that particular institution in general uh, was pretty much an entire lack of any kind of academic freedom whatsoever. Um, and if you can't ask questions, if you can't go in directions that are unexpected, if you can't pursue truth wherever it goes, then you're never going to get to the truth. You'll right. never find the truth. Because they've decided we have the truth, here it is, and all discussion is over. And that's not reasonable or healthy. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of institutions, you're not allowed to say or think or believe certain things just because you'll get yourself in trouble. People will yell at you and condemn you and call you names. Uh, that's the other clue that you're not dealing with rationality is when people resort to name calling to denounce you. Mm -hmm. Or they scream at you so that you can't talk. Which is interesting because that's happening now in the universities that were the bastions of academic freedom mm -hmm. and freedom of speech. Yeah, it's a sad state of affairs. And it comes from a fear of the truth. One of the things that I realized at an early age, and it sounds funny when I say it, but it comes from this mindset that you run across, is that I learned not to be afraid of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And why that is more empowering than what it may initially sound like, it's because one of the things I realized with Christianity is the basis for authority for what we believe about anything is the Bible. And so if I were to discover something biblically that ran counter to what I was being taught, what I had thought I believed, then that's okay because then I need to adjust what I think I believe or reject what I was but that's where that knowledge base comes in though a lot of people are afraid to have 
those basic beliefs challenged because they don't know enough about the Bible. They don't know enough of the Bible because yeah. they're not in the Word and they're not reading through the Bible. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's what I learned from you mm -hmm. is to read through the Bible every year because then when somebody says, well, what about this? And you can say, well, there's scripture that says that mm -hmm. can't be. Yeah. So. And see, one of the things that will happen too often is people will develop an idea based on a small piece of the Bible and either be unaware or decide to ignore all of the parts of the Bible that would create difficulties for their decision on how they're interpreting this particular point. So for instance, one of the discussions I've had with people on occasion is the status of women in the church. And there are churches that believe that women should be silent, should not be allowed to teach men. Wear hats. Well, that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking primarily in the idea of teaching and preaching and all of that. And they will park themselves on a couple of scriptures that Paul wrote, but they ignore a lot of other information in the Bible that creates difficulties with how they're interpreting what it is that Paul has said there. That is, as you go through the biblical materials, besides the part in Galatians where Paul says that in Christ there's neither male nor female, uh, you also have a Pentecost, uh, the quotation from the book of Joel, that uh, both men and women, young men and young women, will prophesy. Mm -hmm. Plus you have examples in the New Testament and the Old Testament of women prophesying. Then you also have examples in Paul's letter to the church in Rome in chapter 16. You have a female deacon by the name of Phoebe. You have a female apostle by the name of Junia. Um, and you have examples of women teaching men and being in positions of authority throughout the Bible. So whatever it is that Paul has said in those passages that people like to park themselves on, if you insist on your point of view, then you have to ignore all these other parts of the scripture. And so I would suggest that rather than assume we will just pretend these other things aren't existing, perhaps we need to reinterpret our understanding of what we think this passage is saying. Because it's very easy to misunderstand things. Uh, I'll hear people make stupid statements along the lines of, uh, you know, science keeps coming up with new ideas, but the Bible is always the same. Well, yes, the Bible is always the same, and the universe is always the same. How we interpret either of them is likely to change as we get more information. So for instance, for a long time, people thought that the Earth was the center of the universe or that the Earth was flat. Uh, we've learned over time that that is not the case, that the Earth is spherical and the Earth revolves on its axis and goes around the sun annually. You have places in the Bible that talk about the sun rising and the sun setting. Are we going to insist that those passages need to be interpreted that the earth is actually standing still and the sun is going around us? That would be ludicrous and stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, even today, you look up in the newspaper, what time does the sun rise today? Mm -hmm. We know that it's the earth that's rotating on its axis, but that's we the common way that, right. of describing what it is we're seeing. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the philosopher, uh, Wittgenstein, I think his name was. One day, uh, one of his students came to him and said, isn't it silly how people used to think that the earth went around the sun? And he says, well, yes, but when you look at the sun coming up, that's kind of the way it looks. Mm -hmm. You're not stupid for initially thinking that that's what that it is. the sun goes around the earth. Or the, sun goes around, yeah, the sun goes around the like, earth. I was like, okay, was this a science fiction <laughs> thing that no, you're no, talking no. about? No, just misspeaking, <laughs> which is easy to do. Yes. Um, when I was in college, well, um, one of the popular notions in modern Christianity is creationism, six-day creationism. Mm -hmm. Six-day creationism is actually a relatively recent innovation in evangelical Christianity. But, I remember, but to listen to them talk, you would think that it came down with Moses on yes, the third tablet. Because I remember when it first impacted the church I was attending. Mm -hmm and became something that people started talking about. Prior to that, we talked about theistic evolution or day-age theories or things like that. And suddenly in the late 60s, early 70s, creationism, looking for Noah's Ark, all these hmm. things started to become a big 
deal. We have a set of books in our library here, which I had intended to have here with me, but oh well, I cool. forgot to bring them. They are in red bindings. They originally published um, in 19, well, between 1910 and 1915, and they were called The Fundamentals, A Testimony to the Truth. Um, and they were published by uh, what ultimately became Biola University. Mm. Uh, Bible Institute of Los Angeles is what it was called at the time. Which is where they got the word Biola from. Yes. Um, and the word fundamentalism as we use it today mm -hmm. is derived from the title of those books. Mm -hmm. Now what's interesting, and it was, these came out of the beginnings of the fundamentalist modernist controversy which riled Christianity back in the 1920s. Um, they talked about what were fundamental ideas within Christianity. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is in those books, which would be denounced by some fundamentalists today, they argued that, you know, theistic evolution, the earth being very old, these are okay things. That is, mm -hmm. they're not incompatible with the biblical materials. Um, by the time I got to college in the uh, mid-70s, creationism was dominant. And that's what I was taught while I attended uh, my undergraduate institution. And over time, I became very disillusioned with it, primarily because I found the biblical materials, and because I can read Hebrew, uh, did not match or fit with that point of view. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people that was led astray, as some would call it, <laughs> by the Bible itself in rejecting six-day creationism. But one of the textbooks that I had when I was at that college uh, in the biology class uh, is an appalling piece of work because it makes statements that are fundamentally not true. And so either the author of the book was consciously lying or the author of the book was incompetent, either of which is a shocking idea. Um, Always go with the incompetence theory Yeah, first. incompetence <laughs> is usually the better theory to go with. That is, people usually are not malicious. And so incompetence is the likely explanation. So, for instance, one of the things that stands out to me in that book was that they used uh, the second, um, second law of thermodynamics as uh, proof that <laughs> evolution couldn't happen because second law of thermodynamics talks about how everything becomes more and more disordered over time mm -hmm. and more chaos increases. I remember increases. learning that, like the, the birds on an island are less and less colorful because every generation because mm -hmm. of that. Now the problem with the concept that. though is the second law of thermodynamics is something that is for a closed system. Mm -hmm. That is, if you have a pot of water on your stove and you turn it on, the water is boiling. When you turn it off, it stops boiling and eventually returns to room temperature. That is, that's what the second law of thermodynamics does for you. However, as long as you keep put injecting energy into it, it will continue to fight against the second law of thermodynamics. Biological systems, by their nature, are fighting against the second law of thermodynamics. That is, when you were a zygote, you were far less complicated than you are now. And yet, over time, through natural processes, you became more and more complex until you're a fairly complicated being at this point as an adult. Uh, biology is, con is runs counter or fights against that second law by its very nature. <coughs> as long as you're injecting energy in the system, that is, if you stop eating, stop drinking water, stop breathing, you'll become far less complex. <laughs> but as long as you continue to do that, you become more complex. Um, so I'm not fat, I'm just very complex. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Probably not the best answer, but you know, no. I'm joking. Um, so, anyway, um, dangerous ideas are something that need to be looked into and we should not be afraid of them. That is, people can ask, you know, people say there's no such thing as stupid questions. These people have never taught a college class. Freshman college Or freshman class. Cl college class. Um, 
people can ask stupid questions, but that does not mean that you tell them to shut up and go away. Instead, you react to the question and explain why the question is, that the answer is no or the question is wrong-headed. Uh, you don't have to scream and yell and shout names at a person in order to shut them down. Um, as an undergraduate, I did a two-part two magazine article and a hundred-page um, I guess you call it um, research paper on what's called British Israelism. I am an expert as a consequence on British Israelism because in order to do the uh, article and in order to do the uh, research paper I had to examine every single th and did examine every single thing that had ever been written by people that believe in British Israelism. As I read I went to first-hand source materials for everything. And the best way of summarizing British Israelism is that it's crackpot, as it is nonsense. And it's nonsense because of its fundamental flaw. That is, the idea of British Israelism is that the ten lost tribes of Israel became British people. The problem with the theory, though, is there's no such thing as ten lost tribes. That has been a popular notion, a lot of uh, Jewish literature from the Middle Ages, and it's a popular notion in people's minds. But if you actually go back and read the biblical materials, you'll discover that there never were ten lost tribes. They never well, disappeared. And then, and so, why British? Why not Asian? Well, Why not African? Why not South American? Well, then we'd have to go into details of the British Israel point of view. Okay. Uh, let's put it this way. The British Israel point of view is a popular theory nowadays with neo-Nazis and Islamic extremists. Hmm. That is, I have discovered British Israel stuff both on neo-Nazi websites as well as on Islamic extremist jihadist uh, websites. Interesting. Um, because the viewpoint is fundamentally anti-Semitic, and so it's going to appeal to both of those groups quite heavily. Uh, the idea of British Israelism is the white Anglo-Saxon people are the actual chosen people of God and the actual Jewish people, and so the Jew people that claim to be Jewish are really not Jewish, and so they can be persecuted and hunted down and so on, which mm. makes neo-Nazis and Islamic extremists very happy. Mm. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible point of view. Um, a few years ago, it's been very many years, a couple decades actually, I had somebody who had a friend who um, was starting to get into British Israelism and uh, she told me that, well, he's got some interesting ideas and I told her flat out, no, he doesn't. And she still wanted me to listen to what I had to say. And it's like, oh, this is a waste of my time. I'm not going to do it. The reason being, I am an expert. I have studied every single thing there is to study mm -hmm. about British Israelism, plus the fundamental idea behind it that there are ten lost tribes, that is bogus. Mm -hmm. There are no ten lost tribes. And so anything you build on top of that, past the ten lost tribes ideas, is wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't have to listen to it anymore. Mm -hmm. If somebody presents something that is nonsensical, you don't have to yell at them, you don't have to call them names. You can simply demonstrate, okay, the reason why your question, your idea, what you're presenting is wrong is because A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. You lay out why something is mistaken. The way we counter bad ideas and bad questions is not by putting guardrails in place. It's by being able to respond to the questions. But of course, that takes more work. That's yeah. harder. It's a lot easier if you just have guidelines and say, okay, you can't step outside of this. Mm -hmm. Because then you don't have to think anymore. Right. And people are lazy by nature. All of us are. I try to do as little as I possibly can. That's why I have Alexas every place in my house. <laughs> so instead and of having to do all the hard course. work of reaching out and hitting a switch, I can just talk to the air and have the switch come on automatically. When I was in Long Beach, uh, the person I was rooming with um, at the hotel, we were both talking about how frustrating it is to have to turn on your light switches. <laughs> yes, we're pathetic. We are. <laughs> but this, 
this carries over into academic settings. Mm -hmm. That is, well, why should we just allow people to willy-nilly have any kind of questions or do anything at all? We'll just say, okay, these are the guidelines, these are speech codes, mm -hmm. these are things we have to do, abide by them, and then. Mm -hmm. But it comes back to that God wants people to be free more than he wants them to be good. Exactly. And the basic. People want people to be good. Right. And one of the basic premises, of especially the of fundamentalist Christianity, is to make people be good. Yeah, well, that's human and, nature. Right, and fundamentalism really in any, in any version, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam, anything like that, just wants people to be good and follow the rules. Well, it's not just within religion, though. Right. It is politically and all mm -hmm. sorts of areas. We want people to behave. Mm -hmm. And so oh, we all behave. <laughs> and so no, we set up more and more rules to try to make people behave That's and to Austin be good. Line. I know. You want people to be good. And what's weird, despite what Paul says, people imagine that that's what God is all about, is wanting people to be good. Mm -hmm. No. That's a consequence of our disobedience in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. And that has become all that we care about and all we focus on all the time. And that was the last thing that God ever wanted us to become aware of because it's a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. It leads to the evil of government necessary evil but still mm -hmm. and all the rules and regulations that we keep piling up and piling up and piling up in the hopes that we'll be able to make people finally be nice to one another. Mm -hmm. And that's not the point of a law. A law is simply a, a measuring stick by which you can punish people. Yeah, that's if all If the rule is for. don't murder, you murder, now we have a way we can punish you for murdering. But then you have to... It doesn't keep people from murdering. No, it doesn't keep people from murdering, and then you have to define what a murder is, and then you have different kinds of murder, mm -hmm. and then you Which have even happens in the Bible. Hate crimes. In the and law. On and on right, and on. in the law. It there's more and more complicated. You know, if you kill someone accidentally, this is what happens. And that's and not murder. If you kill somebody on purpose, this is what happens. And, if you if know. it's accidental, then it's not murder. If it's as a soldier, it's not murder. If it's as a police officer, it's not murder. But if you're mad at your neighbor because he's playing his music too loud and you take an axe to him, suddenly mm -hmm. that's murder. Mm -hmm. Go figure. <laughs> but, um. Yeah. But a lot of the fear of academic freedom, of being able to just take, follow the evidence wherever it happens to lead you, ties into our desire to be good. Because we're afraid that the truth is going to make us do something bad. So for instance, one of the questions I asked was, what if we were to discover that um, homosexuality is caused by a virus? And the fear that people have is that, well, then we would start discriminating against gay people or something. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a silly fear because we don't discriminate against people that have colds or the flu, um, I don't think, or asthma or any other right. illness. Although I will argue that when the whole HIV AIDS thing exploded, mm -hmm. um, there was that fear and it was, I think, legitimate because they did not know how it was spreading. Right. And so they, you know, they talked about having like leper colonies and things like that, which is really a way of discriminating against people. Like, oh, you have HIV, you need to go live mm -hmm. in this town yeah. and be away well, from like everybody. like what used to happen with people that had leprosy because right. we didn't know what caused it. And we didn't know how to treat it. But treat it's... it. And so we wanted to keep everybody that had right. it away from everybody else so that we wouldn't catch it. But if you, if you are actively trying not to discriminate against people but truly trying to find the truth mm -hmm. and if you are aware that that is a potential in whatever you know in, in whatever that thing is that you're trying to discover that you can actually get to the truth mm -hmm. and it not backfire in that yeah way. well say the whole problem is for us as human beings goes back to the great commandment that is, love our neighbors as ourselves, or the golden rule to do to others, you'd have them do to you. And the fear of the truth is that we will find something that will hurt people mm -hmm. somehow, that will damage them. But if we're motivated by love, 
then that really shouldn't be something that we would have to worry about mm -hmm. because we wouldn't use it for bad reasons. Um, it is preventing people from getting at the truth because you're afraid of what it may lead to is not entirely rational fear. That is, if you want to have some constraint on truth, the constraint is, as human beings, we're supposed to love one another. And so if we actually do that, then the truth, whatever it is, is never going to hurt us. Now you do, of course, have certain philosophical systems that um, love is not an important aspect of it. Uh, you think in terms of, um, well, some forms of utilitarianism, for instance. That is, if it's useful, then it's useful. If it's not useful, then kill it. <laughs> and so humans are valuable only as they are functional and useful. And if they are disabled to a certain level or have mental issues to a certain level, then why should we continue to put up with them? They're wasting resources and so on. Now again, asking those kind of questions is not the bad, is not a bad problem. It's how you would choose to answer the question that it would become a problem or not. And so do you decide that human beings are valuable regardless of how useful they are or not? As babies are not particularly useful. Mm -hmm. That is, I have yet to have one that'll mow the grass for me. Mm -hmm. My children would not mow the grass. They didn't change their own diapers. They couldn't do the dishes. They wouldn't vacuum. They were completely useless, and all they did is want things from me. But I think that's the basic belief system behind um, the abortion debate and behind, um, you know, uh, euthanasia and things like mm -hmm. that. Is how useful is this person? If if all they're doing is living on machines, they're using resources, and mm -hmm. there's no sign of life. So therefore, we will terminate their life. <clears throat> and I always opt for where there's life, there's hope. Mm -hmm. And and I've always said, and now it's out there in public view and it's recorded so you can play it back, mm -hmm. is if I'm ever in that situation as the patient, whatever I can do for myself laying there in the bed like my heart beat and breathe, mm -hmm. if I'm able to do those things, then continue the things that I would have to get up to go get for myself like hydration and nourishment. Mm -hmm. But, so if I'm, if my heart is beating and I'm breathing and, and don't cut off the nourishment and mm -hmm. the hydration, because then I feel like, what if that person is inside there? Mm -hmm. And they've had people like wake up from situations like that mm -hmm. and they knew what was going on around them. Mm -hmm. And like I think about that Terry Schiavo who they starved and you know, dehydrated her until she died. And it's like, what if she knew what was going on? That would be horrible to be trapped inside your body, trying to tell people, don't kill me, I'm here. But um, to me, that's just, because you don't know what's going on inside their head. Yeah. And even if they appear to not have signs of life, you don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if, you know, of course, like, as soon as I stop breathing, or as soon as my heart stops, don't be like, well, she's dead. You know, do what you can to, you know, revive me. But if after a given amount of time, there seems to be no ability for me to maintain my own life, then fine, cut off the, the machines. But don't, and I would do that for a loved one if they had not left me um, orders beforehand. I would do that. I would continue with the hydration and the nourishment because you don't know what's going on inside there. And it would be horrible to die that way. Yeah. So. Yeah. The, um, some questions do not have easy answers, and we should not be afraid of examining those kind of questions either. Um, in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, you have... My personal the, favorite. Yes. Uh, that's what converted you to becoming a lover of Star Trek. Yes, a true lover of Star Trek. I enjoyed it. My dad used to watch it, and I would watch it with him, but I didn't really, like, get it. But then, once I saw Wrath of Khan, I was like totally on board. <laughs> Not just because of 
Ricardo Mal Montalban. Only because of Ricardo Montalban going, I am Khan. It was sure came up. <laughs> and for an old guy, that was a nice chest. Yeah. Um, but one of the questions there in the story was the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few or the one, mm -hmm. or the reverse of that. And, you know, you'll run across bumper stickers every so often that say, war is not the answer. And you don't really want to get your philosophy from a bumper sticker anyway. <laughs> But like I would, honk if you love Jesus, people honk and you flip them off. Yes. <laughs> uh, but the problem with the question, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that statement, war is mm -hmm. not the answer, because if the question is, what shall we have for dinner today, <laughs> war would not be the answer. Uh, however, if the question is, how do we deal with the Nazis uh, invading everybody and killing six million Jewish people, uh, then we might want to consider mm -hmm. war. And of course the problem with war, any kind of violence, is with that question. The needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few. Um, also because, a Star Trek thing. Yeah, because war is not ideal by any means. Mm -hmm. It is not a good way of solving problems. It would be nice if there was a better way. As pacifism is a very attractive point of view, but pacifism tends not to work against Nazis. Right which is the problem, or Imperial Japan either, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of totalitarian regime. That is, uh, if you had somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. or uh, Mahatma Gandhi going up against the Nazis, uh, doing the things that they both did to uh, get the Civil Rights Act passed in the U.S. or to get uh, India free from British rule, in neither case would that have been the outcome if they had been doing those sorts of activities in a Nazi Germany situation. Because mm -hmm. all the Nazis would have done is arrest them and execute them. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would not have been an effective way of changing anything. Um, but war, by its nature, you do have people that will die that are innocent. Mm -hmm. that you'll have people that will suffer, bad things will happen to a lot of people that would not happen if there wasn't a war, and a lot of bad things will happen to a lot of people that there's no reason that they should have to endure those awful things. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it becomes a difficult issue. Uh, Christianity over the years you've got two points of view regarding war. You have the pacifists and you have the just war theorists. And who is correct? And they argue with each other. Uh, but I don't think Dietrich that... Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, was on the pacifist side of things until he saw what was going on with Nazi Germany mm -hmm. and he decided sort of like, um, what's his name, um, Emo Phillips, with his dilemma about getting a bicycle. <laughs> and he prayed and prayed and prayed that God would give him a bicycle, and he was getting a bicycle, and he realized that's not the way God works. <laughs> and so he went and stole the bicycle and asked God for forgiveness. <laughs> right. And that's essentially what Bonhoeffer ends up doing. That is, he's really opposed the concept of involving himself in violence, involving himself in war, but he sees no other way to solve the problem of Adolf Hitler, and so he involves himself in a plot to assassinate Hitler, which unfortunately did not work, and he ended up being executed as a consequence mm -hmm. of that about two weeks before the war was over. Mm -hmm. uh, but his thought was, I'll ask for forgiveness then, mm -hmm. because he just could see no other way out. But see, peaceful alternatives should always be chosen before war, but if you have no choice, then you go to war. Yeah, and ideally that's, that should be the way it Right. Is. I don't think taking a stand on one side or the other and saying this is immutable, this is the way it is, this is the only way to do it mm -hmm. on either side, because life doesn't work that way. Yeah. Life is full of gray areas. Yeah, and see World War II is useful in throwing out into this kind of discussion because for most people, it's fairly obvious that Nazism was a problem that had to be solved. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, was there any other solution possible for 
the menace, menace of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. People tend to forget Imperial Japan. Imperial Japan was just as bad, just as vicious. For that matter, the communists were not uh, nice either. One of the things that people forget is the reason World War II started was not just because of Nazi Germany. Russia was equally responsible for the beginning of World War II. World War II began with the invasion of Poland. And it was the agreement that the Germans and the Russians made that started that. That is, the Germans invaded from... You're going to poke me with that thumb and you're going to be super sorry. From the one side, mm -hmm. and the Russians invaded from the other side at the same time. That is, Germany and Russia were both invading He's going to get smacked in five seconds <laughs> if he keeps on doing that. Uh, it was only after He's Germany screwed Russia that Russia then begged for help and became an ally during the course of World War II. But Russia is hardly an innocent in what happened there. And of course, Stalin killed far more people than what Hitler could imagine killing. Um, in any case, um, there is much evil in the world, and how to deal with it becomes an issue. But it needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a case-by-case. -case. And see, this is one of the things that people, again, people like guide rails. They want to have, okay, when faced with circumstance B, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. This is what people want. Mm -hmm. That is, if you give a sermon and say, okay, these are the things that you have to do in order to have a good and peaceful, <laughs> good and peaceful life, <laughs> people will eat that up. Mm -hmm. They will love that. Unfortunately, it's all nonsense because life doesn't work that way. Life right. is very messy, life is very difficult, and you do not have really good guidelines at all beyond Paul, Jesus, the rabbis all agree that the law is summarized by the one commandment love your neighbor as yourself and Paul says the reason why this is your primary guideline if you want to call it a guideline is because love does no harm to its neighbor if you love someone you don't murder them if you love someone you don't steal from them and so on and so that's all you have to think about is what is the loving thing to do which is what would have been the way the world worked prior to Adam and Eve making the poor choice to make good and evil the guideline for everything mm -hmm. and the focus of everything. Love was a much better thing. Oh, it's five o'clock. Yes. First of all, I want to say that we will not be webcasting next week because it's Memorial Day weekend. Yes. We will be at Knott's Berry Farm, so we will not be doing yes. webcast from there. We'll be with and, Daryl. Yes, with our friend Daryl. So from Nevada. And um, so, but we will be back the following week. Did you look for the topic? Uh, the next topic is free speech. Ah, free speech. Wow. Hot topics. Okay, so in two weeks we'll be back with free speech. So, um, Amir Darkly, Unbridled Inquiry, is brought to you by Quartz Hill School of Theology and Quartz Hill Community Church. If you would like to take um, some college level classes in theology and related subjects, um, it's all right there at theology.edu. He also, um, he also uh, can teach Hebrew. Yes, well, I'm getting to that. Oh. So the classes are online, they're free. If you want credit for them, there is a nominal fee. If you live in the area, you can take classes in person on any of the classes that are, list, that are listed in there, including biblical languages. And that was weird. The air conditioning went off and it like made the ceiling make that was a, that, that was this. Huh? That was that. It's oh, windy outside. the wind. Oh, okay. <coughs> so anyway. Um, the Antelope Valley. Yes. So anyway, um, but Quartz Hill School of Theology is a ministry of Quartz Hill Community Church. And we are here at 51st Street West and Avenue K in Quartz Hill. If you live in the Antelope Valley and you're looking for a place to worship, we meet um, at, here at the church at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And we would love for you to come join us. If you don't live in the Antelope Valley or you have some other reason why you can't get here, um, we do live stream our services on Facebook at 11 a.m. Pacific time. 
Um, you can also look on our face on the church's Facebook page and see previous services. Eventually, I will learn the editing software and I will get the sermons posted on the website. But yeah. that takes a backseat to the millions of other things I've been doing, like yeah, taking care of my been, mother and. Yeah, you know, I've also gotten behind on putting uh, Mirror Darkly things up on our YouTube channel. Ah, okay. So, so they're all I, on the Facebook page, but they haven't gotten. Yes. Over there yet. Okay, you need to stop. You're you're going to dangerous. He won't he won't <laughs> hit you. I've only been clobbered once in the thirty six years well, almost forty years we've been together, and I just hit him back. So Yeah. But he generally won't hit you. I do so. move my hands. Yes. Out. But even though he does not know where he is in space, space knows where he is and it tends to keep room between us. So anyway, <laughs> um so uh, that's our commercial. So we'll see you in two weeks and enjoy your Labor Day. Bye, guys.